This past summer, I visited my parents shortly after my mother completed six months of chemo and radiation for her cancer treatment. And despite these struggles, or possibly because of them, I wanted to sit down with her and record some of the family stories. So what this is, what I'm about to share, is one of those stories. This is about my grandfather from when he was a boy and some of the family struggles that they went through. And after this story, I'll be back to reflect on it a little bit to end. A favorite Boyd story that's been told th through the years about God's providence and how he's interested in our activities is a really fun story because you can find a parallel story in the Bible. You'll think of it as we go along. So this story happened when my father-in-law was a little boy. His family had moved from Idaho Springs, Colorado, across the Rocky Mountains to Rulison, and things hadn't worked out real well for them in that move. They'd primarily moved so that the children could go to a Seventh-day Adventist school through at least the 10th grade. Well. They got there, and the job didn't work out just right, and the place that they were on had a few fruit trees, but not very many, but Grandpa Boyd planted some more. There were six children, and it was difficult for the family to grow enough to eat, and it was also during the Depression, so it was everybody was having a hard time. And then the school closed. So it was kind of a disappointment to them, and they had a hard time. This was in the Depression. It was hard to come by money or food, and when things didn't work out the way they planned, it was difficult. But somehow, um, John's dad, I'm going to call him Grandpa Boyd, Grandpa Boyd would be able to bring home a 25-pound bag of flour, and Grandma Boyd would make bread. But things got tighter, and, and so sometimes the neighbors would help them. One neighbor gave them milk every day, and one neighbor that kind of came to visit, sometimes would fill his pockets with eggs before he'd come, so the family would have eggs. And there were six children, and so there's a lot of mouths to feed, and Grandma Boyd would bake bread. And six children and Mommy and Daddy can get through a lot of bread in a short amount of time. And then she ran out of flour. And so she went to a neighbor, asked to borrow flour. Then she went to another neighbor, asked to borrow flour. And then it got a little embarrassing. She couldn't go back and ask again. So this empty flour bar, but then she went back to see if she could scrape out and buy spoonfuls. According to the story that Aunt Ruth wrote in the junior guide, she scraped flour out of that flour bin. Enough to make a little sponge to grow yeast overnight, kind of like a sourdough starter, probably. According to the story that Aunt Ruth wrote in the and published, it was published in the Junior Guide, she scraped out enough flour, spoonful by spoonful, to make six loaves of bread. And then the flower was gone. And in the valley in, in Denver, their friend Bob says, the Boyds need me. I don't know why, but the Boyds need me. So he got on his Harley Davidson and drove the 200 miles over the mountains. And I'm going to stay in the snow, and you're going to think I'm kidding, but that's what Aunt Ruth put in the story. And he got to Rulison, and he said, I need to take the Boyds a gift, and I don't know what. So he stopped at the little store, and he thought, soap? 
shortening wedge. So he said, oh, I'll take them this hundred pound sack of flour. How often Grandma Boyd had wanted, had prayed for flour. Now he's on a motorcycle, put it across his handlebars and drove out to the Boyd place. When Grandma Boyd saw that sack of flour, she could hardly speak through her tears. And she went into her bedroom and she knelt down. And she thanked God for providing in such a dramatic way the flower that she prayed for. It's interesting to me that all three boys in that family grew up to be pastors. That is my grandfather and his two brothers. This experience and others shaped their faith and their view of God. They wanted to share the good news of a loving God who sees our struggles and sends people to help. Those brothers grew up understanding the truth that sometimes we're the ones out helping others and sometimes we are the ones who need a hero on a Harley. And this story reminds me of something that Carl Wilkins said when I interviewed him in 2012 about his experience during the Rwandan genocide. He said, it's often pretty meaningless to use phrases like, God was with me, God protected me, God provided for me. It says when we stop and ask, how did God provide for me, protect me? How was God with me? We start to see this truth we've known all along. God's primary way of intervening on this planet is through people. Ellen White conveys the same idea, but in a slightly different way. She says, through his human agents, God desires to be a comforter such as the world has never before seen. For me, I'm thankful to Bob and to God for taking care of my family. But now I have to ask myself, am I listening to God's whisper? I mean, we are all called to be compassionate and generous. So yes, we need to support others and be a blessing whenever possible. But would I even hear if God were trying to call me to a mission today? And if I did feel impressed to go, you know, help a specific person, whether that's across the state, across town, or just across a grocery store aisle, would I be like Bob and go? Or would I make my excuses and miss the chance to lighten someone's load and make it easier to bear? And finally, for me personally, I think the most important takeaway from this whole story is God wants me to ride a Harley. No, joking aside, I do hope the story encourages you uh, to be like Bob, to, to have your, your heart and, and ears open. I hope that we will respond to lighten someone's load to make their road easier to travel. In the main part of this video, I thanked three people or groups. First were the kind neighbors like the Schumanns who shared their milk, eggs, and flour with my family. That's the kind of neighbor I want to have that I want to be. And I also thanked Bob for responding to the call and heading out on his bike. One thing I didn't mention was that he later became Uncle Bob. So how did that happen? The oldest child in the family, I mean the oldest of my grandfather's siblings, was Violet. She was around 18 when this story took place. She later married a man named Cloyd. And in fact, one of the photos I shared earlier is of Violet and Cloyd on their Harley. And in the same picture is Violet's younger sister, Ruth, with her husband, Archie. So that sister, Ruth, is the one who published this story for the family in the Junior Guide. Cloyd later died in a motorcycle accident. And then Violet actually married Bob. So my dad grew up knowing Uncle Bob as a kind man who was fun to camp and fish with. Unfortunately, I don't have pictures of Bob on a Harley. So I use these photos with my grandfather's sisters and their motorcycle club. All of these photos were taken sometime after this flower story, but before Bob and Violet were married. The third thanks was gratitude to God who made the flower miraculously multiply and then woke Bob from his sleep, calling him to go meet the Boyd's pressing need. Those miracles are part of the family legacy of faith that have been handed down to me. 
this story and some of the others that I mentioned my mother recorded at the same time are important for our family. They remind us that God is still active, that God sees and cares. Not everything is miraculously fixed, but we remember these special stories as a God who says, I see you, you are not alone. And now the fourth and final thanks is a huge shout out to Kirstein's. I drove down to Kirstein's World of Motorcycle Museum near North Judson, Indiana, and that's where I recorded the introduction and conclusion for this story. They let me spend an afternoon filming in their amazing space. And so for this project, I focused on their collection of Harley Davidsons, but they have a lot of other makes as well. Moto Guzzi, Indian, Yamaha, Kawasaki, and so many more. And in addition to the bikes themselves, the walls are covered with posters and ads and photographs, memorabilia. You really need to experience it for yourself. So I encourage you to go to kirsteinscycle.com to plan your visit. Thank you so much, Kirsteins. So now to wrap up this video, I'll finish with more footage of the museum. I hope you enjoy. <laughs>